Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Namita Rao, and I'm here to talk about uh, the topic, how do you make a shift from the traditional model to DevOps? And I hope that after a hearty lunch, you're in for some talk, and uh, you know, this keeps you interested. So I, am, uh, I work uh, at Treebox Solutions, a Singapore startup, as a software QA lead. And uh, as I mentioned before, it's about a shift from traditional model to DevOps. And uh, why me for this topic would be because I have worked as a QA engineer across these three companies, which are in three different countries, and also parallelly an entrepreneur. So this gives me a better idea about things as worked across three organizations. And as mentioned, three organizations had these two traditional models, and one has DevOps. And being a QA, it's actually giving me a neutral, unbiased, and holistic view about the whole process. So what's my story here? My story here is how the transition happens from good, better, best. Who are these good, better, best, and how they can make this transition? So to start off with the story, let's talk about good. And good here is the waterfall model. And as you are aware, the waterfall model was the traditional one starting from requirements going all the way to maintenance in a very linear fashion. And that used to be typically the way they say the waterfall. And why was it that good was not considered better enough? That was because it was linear, it created silos, there was finger pointiness, there was risk and uncertainty and a lot of inflexibility. So that's what made it not better. But why did agile become the better model? Now, as you can see, it's the same as the waterfall model, but what makes it different is the whole feedback mechanism. So that's how good became better, and we were following that model. But then why is it that we don't consider agile to be the best amongst everything? That is mainly because there is lack of communication, coordination, and collaboration. And we needed another model so that it could fill in this gap, and we could get one of the best models that we can work on. And that's where DevOps came in. And the foundation of DevOps is three things, culture, people and processes, and tools. And contrary to popular belief, DevOps is much more than just automation and tools. And we need a culture in DevOps that includes people and processes. And it should be in such a way that the missing elements, communication, collaboration, and integration are actually a part of it. And obviously, we need the tools to get the processes in motion. Now, some of the tools that I have shown you here in this slide are that which we use in our company at Treebox. But as you are all aware, there are a lot more tools in the market currently that you can pick up to actually get the processes working. So now coming to the main topic, how do you make this transition? So there are three key things that needs to be considered. That is awareness, building consensus, and execution. Keeping these three as the base, we are going to see how the transition works. So if you want to move from waterfall to DevOps, then you need to be aware that you are taking two leaps forward. You need to have an individual team level consensus, and you need to make an end-to-end -end process change. Only then is it possible. But if you want to move from agile to DevOps, then in that case, you need to be aware that it's nothing but a disciplined agile approach. You need an inter-team consensus and a project or product team creation. So that's how it differs in each one of them. But as always, things can go wrong. So in DevOps, in terms of culture, what can go wrong is bad leadership and also the fact that there are trust issues. Trust is the foundation of the culture here, but if things are not going to be working there, then it's all gone. And in terms of people and processes, obviously there would be process disagreements when there are many people involved. And there can also be a case where we are not able to understand how to prioritize things. And with tools, of course, there are so many tools in the market now that you're gonna get confused and you don't know how much time to allocate and also end up using tools just because they are cool and not using it for the right purpose. So that's where the things can go wrong. But having gone through this journey myself, the lessons that I have learned is that it's finally about trust. And not just between dev and ops, but between everyone, so that we can all know that we are working towards the best thing for the business overall. So what is my recommendation from the experiences? It is that using tools doesn't make it DevOps. And friendship and, and the freedom and ownership to individual teams is important. And also the trust 
which is developed within the team will eventually radiate as confidence with the customers. So I would like to leave you with this note that DevOps is about people, wherein everyone is aware that every little contribution that they make is going to add immense value and help the business ultimately. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Ini from PubWorks. So um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about treating your repositories and artifacts. I guess first thing to think of another buzzword, well, maybe. But I do have a kind of a concrete use case that we can use it for. So one of the concrete use cases is dependency hell. So let's walk through our scenarios together. Just imagine <coughs> the de deployment here. Um, you deploy the development, staging, everything is fine. You've automated a lot of stuff all the environments are the same. So you're like deploying to production, everything was fine, you're high fiving with your teammate, you're celebrating, going to get some cake and stuff. And then you're like, oh, actually, the monitoring looks a little bit red. Oh, it's fine, it was settled down after a while. But like, oh, actually, um, it's really red. Okay, well, let's have a look. They're like typing your way through and thinking, what can possibly go wrong? And they're like, oh, that Nginx version looks a bit strange there. And they're like, well, can't be. Oh, they released a new version. Oh dear. Well, you're like, well, you're pretty upset, but you're like, fine. I will pin it to a particular version. Uh, it's upsetting, but whatever. And then you realize, oh, they removed their old version. <laughs> now you're really stuck. Um, Sure, some of you have similar experience. Um, I think maybe treating your repository as an artifact might be able to solve it. So what does it really mean? Well, it basically means take your current repository along with third party stuff, you version it, deploy it, test it, and then promote it to the next environment, so on and so forth. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, um, you talk about containers. Well, Container is the next step up, and in reality, not all companies are ready to move on to cutting edge stuff. So maybe this is a in-between solution. Um, at least a tool that I've been using, um, without any of the fancy stuff, it's just a good old Debian repository. But what actually makes Apple shine is its ability to actually take snapshot. So what snapshot is, is just kind of what I described. It takes your repository along with third party stuff and take a snapshot of that current state of the repository so that you can actually promote it to different environment. So another really cool thing that Abby actually does is it allows you to cherry pick. So you can have your snapshot and then you cherry pick the one that you actually want and remove the one that you don't want so that you move around smaller packages around environment. So uh, let's walk through the scenarios to get up. You have mirrors on the interweb, you take a snapshot of it and then put it into your local repository called mirrors. And we have some Nginx stuff there, Sensu stuff and Puppet stuff. And you notice there's two Nginx um, packages there. Now we have very, very hard working developers developing code and um, creating package, putting it into the local um, repository, so another portion of it. Um, now it comes to time to actually integrate and do our deployment. So what do we do? Well, we take a snapshot of it and um, version it and create an artifact out from it. And you notice there's only one Nginx there and it is the previous version of it. And then you take that and then you serve it on your favorite web server and deploy it. So what actually also make it good is um, when auditor comes around, you can actually show them this is, this, I mean, this are the packages that we are gonna deploy in this package, in this version. Another thing is to simplify your, your um, config management code in the sense that um, all you need to do is install latest. So if you want to install a different version, swap out the different version of your repository artifact. You have control. I think that's one of the most important things that we're trying to solve for. One of the many important things that we're trying to solve. We automate a lot of stuff. We're trying to make the environment the same. We don't like surprises and hopefully by using this couple of ideas will help you make things and have more control. So thank you. Um, talk to me if you have any question. Thanks.
Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Surya. Um, and today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, developer happiness uh, at Redmart. Just a bit of intro. Redmart is an e-commerce and logistic company that is based out of Singapore. And uh, I am the DevOps, uh, DevOps lead at Redmart. And uh, here's my contact details. So uh, when we talk about uh, developer happiness at Redmart, it is only meaningful when um, we take a look back at how far uh, the company has come from the early days. Just like any e-commerce company, uh, Redmart MVP started uh, um, with a Magento applications. And then um, we soon realized that it's not going to scale and we need uh, to build our own platform. So the first version of uh, Redmart app was a big monolithic app. And um, as the business was ramping up and complexity grew, uh, we realized that um, in order for the team to scale and to keep the developers happy, we have to move on to uh, microservices. And that's where our pursuit of uh, developer happiness started. So today, uh, this is how our tech stack looks like. Um, if you see, it is very diverse. But if you see the team structure itself, it's even more diverse, not only in terms of the skill set, but also in terms of the culture and nationality. This is how uh, our uh, tech pipeline looks like, and this, is, uh, this has allowed us to achieve uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, as you can see, this is our uh, environment setup. We have three setups, which is the feature environment. Uh, alpha or the pre-production uh, environment and then the production environment. Um, any new features that is being implemented um, are being tested in isolation um, while um, they are still leveraging some of the services in the pre-production environment. In order for, uh, for us to achieve uh, this sharing concept, there are obviously a number of steps that is required but we always strive to make life simple for the developers. So we added uh, automation tools and all um, to make sure that every developers are able to create this feature environment uh, easily. So uh, thanks to all these awesome tools, um, all the steps that you saw just now are just uh, one click away now. <coughs> also, um, we have uh, switch uh, adopted uh, the GitHub flow in order to reduce our cycle time um, and currently, we are experimenting with the uh, semantic versioning um, to bring our uh, deployment of microservices even easier. So the concept of my uh, semantic versioning is simple. There are three types of releases. There's a major release, which corresponds to uh, the things when we push and it breaks the backward compatibility. Minor is when we push new features. Um, patch is when we push the hotfix. <coughs> And this is uh, the fully automated uh, process that we are currently testing uh, in our current uh, continuous integration and uh, deployment process. So obviously throughout this journey, we have faced uh, a lot of challenges. One of the biggest challenges that we face is that uh, as the team keeps growing, um, we have people, different people at different um, skills and uh, exposure level. Um, so the, 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 the challenge is how do we make sure uh, that these people are able to get up to speed and be productive as quickly as possible. So, um, so now let's take a look at the, uh, the state of uh, developer happiness at Threadmart. Obviously on one end we have the monolith where we came from and um, on the other end is the microservices where we ultimately want to be at. Um, we are not quite there yet. Uh, we think we are somewhere around here. Um, obviously, there are still uh, a lot of things uh, that uh, we need to do in order for us to achieve uh, or to reach the state that we wanted to. So these are some of the things that uh, we are uh, working on in order to, you know, to take us to the level that we want. Um, so no doubt, uh, we have uh, progressed a lot. Um, but uh, it is very easy that you know if we uh, don't remind ourselves, we might be going back to the old uh, traps uh, and end up in creating more silos. So one thing that uh, I always keeps uh, at heart is that DevOps is all about culture, automate 
uh, everything that you do, make sure that you uh, keep it lean and measure all the things that you do. And DevOps is all about sharing uh, knowledge and responsibility. Thank you. So this is my first Ignite talk, so this will be interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. All right, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, DevOps, TLAs, and the CFO. So uh, maybe I could do it um, as a four-letter acronym, or maybe an FFLA. And you'd be like, gosh, what on earth is an FLA? Um, and you'd be really confused if I did my whole talk using you know, three-letter acronyms. And so you'd be sort of going back on the MRT today thinking, what was that guy talking about when he had that five-letter acronym up? And you'd be thinking, gosh, what was... What was FLAM? What does FLAM stand for? Um, FLAM stands for, five letter acronyms are meaningless, by the way. So today, I would really, really want to talk about how we get the CFO engaged with DevOps. Um, and the thing about DevOps really is, it's not just DevOps, it's DevOps, Sec, Arc, Fic, which is really the shorthand way of saying developers, operations, infosec, and architecture, we've really got to invite our new best friend to the party. And you know who that new best friend is? It's the CFO. And CFO, by the way, doesn't stand for Chinese Feng Shui Optimization, as one Chinese lady told me over today. It actually stands for this guy. And this guy is really, really important because he's got a big checkbook, and we love a guy with a big checkbook, don't we? In fact, we love a woman with a really big checkbook. But I won't go there, because I'll probably be asked to leave the stage. Um, so why would the CFO be crucial to DevOps? I mean, who here's invited their uh, CFO along to a DevOps meeting? You know, if you put your hand up, you're a liar. No one's invited their CFO to a DevOps meeting. You can see it, right? On a Monday morning, he's standing next to the CFO at the water cooler tower, and he's saying, hey, Mr. CFO, come on to a DevOps meeting. We talk about you know, continuous integration, continuous build. Uh, we talk about uh, systems automation, pipeline release management, and he's sort of backing away, going, what on earth is this guy talking about? And you know, so you try, you know, he's looking at you like this guy, right? So you try a second denial of service attack using code speak. You say, if CFO has lots of money, Invite to DevOps. Attendance equals mandatory. No attendance, shut down all IT systems. And so the DevOps, so the CFO is really, really important because he's got lots of these. He might have guns, but he's actually got lots and lots of money. And do you need money to do DevOps? You know, well, I'd actually argue you really do need money to do DevOps. So you can buy lots of stuff, right? Because DevOps requires change, and change organizationally, tool wise, systems wise, architecturally wise. It requires money to do that. And so, who's, the, who's got the most benefit from doing DevOps? Well, the guy that's got the most benefit from doing DevOps is this guy again, right? He's the CFO. So, what do CFOs care about? They care about how much money comes in and how much money goes out. And what's DevOps supposed to do? It's supposed to increase the amount of money coming in and it's supposed to decrease the amount of money going out, right? That, that would make him happy and it would make these guys happy too. They're the shareholders, by the way. They're really interesting. You should meet them one day. So, if the shareholders are happy, right? The CFO is happy, then we're all high-fiving each other. So I really want us to think about how we get the CFO bought into it. And really, DevOps is about this, as I explain it to business leaders. It's about compressing the innovation cycle. How do you get an idea into a piece of code, into production, in the most expeditious manner possible? That's really what it's about. And when that happens, the sausage machine works, the business is happy, and everyone's high-fiving. And this guy, our, our CIO at Red Hat, he has this concept called he wants to scare the business with his DevOps team. And not in a bad way, but in a way when the CFO and the business comes along and says, hey, we've got this idea, we've got some money, can you help us? And his team goes, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll have it up and running next week and we'll have the first drop probably in about a month. And it's only going to cost you, you know, about five grand. And the business sort of backs away and goes, whoa, 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 we, whoa, whoa, we just came to you with an idea. You know, we, we haven't actually got our, our act together. We'll, we'll come back to you about a month's time. So this is the idea of you know, DevOps really, really changing the game for business, and the CFO has just got a smile on his face. So this is where I want us to think about how we do communicate to the CFO, because CFOs have really weird dreams from us, right? They think in terms of output per headcount, they think cost to income ratios, balance sheets, you know, revenue, revenue per employee, totally different speed. So I'm going to suggest to you four real quick things. The first one is around efficiency. We have to explain the efficiency to the CFO. Mr. CFO, if we do DevOps, we're going to have 50% more applications out per year, which is going to drive revenue in. The second one we want to talk about to the, uh, to the CFO is around the multiplier effect. And so that is, 
you know, Mr. CFO, when we do DevOps, we're going to bring more applications out to production, which is going to draw revenue in, but we're going to actually get things continuously improved, which is going to have a reduction in our cost. So that's got the multiplier effect, so that ought to make you happy. The third thing we really, really want to talk to them about is regulation. You know, Mr. CFO, you know all that money you spent on doing uh, regulation and, and uh, compliance? You know, well, maybe we could do that 20 to 30 percent with uh, less, less effort and less cost, so that ought to make you happy. And then the fourth is we really want to talk about agility. And so, if, Mr. CFO, if we do DevOps, it's going to make us a lot more agile. That means we're going to be able to respond to competitive pressures. It means we're going to be able to innovate much faster. Instead of all that money spent on change management, we're going to do it through DevOps. So I hope I've given you some ideas to think about how to talk to the CFO and how we can all be good stewards and how we can get the CFO bought into our vision. But really, it's not our vision, it's his vision. Thank you.